Hello, well, I'm John Goodridge, I'm a professor of English at Nottingham Trent University, and um, I've been studying labour in past poetry for a, a long, 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 long time. And um, I just wanted to start by saying that the three around Farnham has got one missing. Three around Farnham really should have this one in as well. Uh, some remarks of the author's life drawn by herself by Mary Collier. Um, she talks about how she published The Woman's Labour, and then she says, um, uh, Having continued a washroom till I was 63 years of age, I left Petersfield to go and take care of a farmhouse near Alton, and there I stayed till I turned 70. And then the infirmities of age rendered me incapable of the labour of that place. Now I have retired to a garret to the poor poet's fate in Alton, where I'm endeavouring to pass the relic of my days in piety, purity, peace and an old maid. I would love to know where that farmhouse is and where that garret is, but I'm afraid there's no blue plaque. <laughs> Mary Collier is one of the, like, the key figure in the first community of labouring class poets I'm going to talk about. First of all, I think I ought to do something about what David said about purity yesterday. It made, like, you, I went away thinking, oh my God, poetry's the opposite of that, isn't it? Poetry's a terrible, solitary activity, you know, done in secret, you know. This is Pope, isn't it? This is Pope says, you know, is there anyone who, maddened enough, doesn't have any writing tools, is, scrawls with charcoal around his dungeon walls? I mean, poetry is a solitary activity. And my labouring class poets, there's the database. Um, it's online uh, now, thanks to some wonderful American graduate students, mostly. This is a word version of it. Um, but uh, every now and again they give me it, they know, they realise I'm a bit simple about technology, so they make a word copy of it for me because I don't understand the database. Yeah, <laughs> e. John, you, you can check this one, it'll be okay. So this is the latest version of a project that started with me basically trying to annoy the editor of the Dictionary of National Biography about a quarter of a century ago by sending a long green ink list of poets that weren't in. <laughs> and um, it sort of grew into this. Monster. Um, oh, there are. There's my magician in America, Katie Osborne at Notre Dame, who's uh, who's turning it into something marvellous. And what this is is a is a basic sort of skeleton. Oh, we've got lots of advisors to look. Skeleton um, skeleton entry at least on all the poets we can find who were clearly of humble origin, declaredly or probably. Um, who published at least one poem between 1700 and 1900 in these islands. And I say that slightly cautiously because we really haven't done Ireland very well. And as for Wales, we're all terrible monoglots, so there's a massive tradition there that's not recorded. Um, we have 1,719 named poets at the moment. OK, just a few quick statistics... Uh, about a quarter are uncertain inclusions, so possibly dubious. Um, 212 of these are female. 972 of them are Scottish. There's a good reason for that. Scotland valued its labouring class poets much, much more than anywhere else on the islands. And... Um, recorded them, recorded their, you know, had, had anthologies and so on, which include biographical information, which means that um, we, could, we can get to that much more easily. And also I think there's a, a clear correlation between the Scottish labouring class tradition and the Scottish diaspora of the 19th century. Actually, my one strongest piece of evidence on that is a really kind of tenuous thing that gave me a clue. Um, about ten years ago, I was asked at the end of the uh, financial year to spend a lot of money quickly. Uh, they had five grand or something and they said, go and spend that on the internet and get us a collection of labouring class poetry. What fun I had that week, <laughs> spending money. Um, the interesting thing was most of the volumes that I got were Scottish volumes. And where was I buying them from? From booksellers in Canada, in New Zealand, in Australia in the United States. In other words, all the destinations of the Scottish diaspora, that's where the volumes seem to have ended up. And it, that sort of got me thinking about what the purpose might be. So we've got this very strong 
Scottish presence, much less so with Irish or Welsh, but then that's, that's partly, as I say, because we haven't searched properly. And, um, yeah, I've said, I said something about that diaspora issue there. Okay, and we've made some groupings and categories, but we haven't really done much advanced work on individuals. But you can find some interesting things, you know, if you, um, if you search. Um, I've, for instance, found a Keswick Road maker that would be of interest to you, um, Laker enthusiasts, Christopher Murray Boosted, Roadman of Keswick, who published Rustic Verses and Dialect uh, Rhymes. I found the, um, the Penge Potato Cellar Poet, Joseph Guire, terrible, absolutely terrible poet. But on the front, it actually, it, it stamped on the front, it says, by royal appointment. What a cheek. He wrote a note to Queen Victoria, clearly, and her, you know, secretary would have said, you know, the Queen acknowledges your letter, that's it, by royal appointment. Um, so you got some people who were chancers. Uh, yeah, see, I told you he was a potato poet. He was a potato salesman. Oh, he also got his vicar in the Baptist church to say that the, the volume was very moral. Um, <laughs> A lot of these, you know, it was a selling point being a labouring class poet. Sometimes it was something imposed, you know, that Claire didn't really set out to be the Northamptonshire peasant. He set out to be a poet like James Thompson, whose seasons he'd read and adored. Um, very often that was a, it was a limitation. But to go back to this business of what poetry is and if it's an individualistic thing, I think the labouring class poets had a particular problem because um, what you've got there is a kind of vertical model. You have a tradition of isolated individuals. You know, the key figure who emerges in 1730, Stephen Duck, um, emerges from village culture. He's been reading Milton at night and Bish's Art of Poetry and essays in The Spectator about how you should write, to the annoyance, apparently, of his, his wife. Um, and he gets to, you know, the local vicar and his wife get to know about this. You can't do anything in the village, even secretly at night. You can't do anything in the village without somebody getting to know about it. The, village, the vicar and his wife find out about this. They encourage him to write on his own situation. The result is the thresher's labour and the tradition of labouring class poets and labouring class poets writing about their own life and labour is born. But even before that, you've got stray figures like John Taylor, the water poet of the 17th century, who is a, a water boatman, you know, in other words, a kind of 17th century taxi driver. You know, I had that Samuel Pepys in the back of my boat. <laughs> that kind of figure. And he, he started writing poetry, I think, to amuse his customers. Uh, Ned Ward, who was a, a publican, initiated the tradition of publicans writing verse, again, very much to do with their trade. You did have uh, a communitarian tradition, and that was the craft guilds, you know, a, po a poem on the tailor craft, things that were part of annual um, fe festivities or activities, right through to one I found in Bristol Central Library, uh, the Lamplighters of Bristol's uh, Christmas Verses, which are, you know, these sort of jolly uh, doggerel verses about their work, ending up with an appeal for a, a bit of extra Christmas from their people whose streets they're lighting. Um, so you have got this kind of uh, thing running alongside the tradition of the, uh, the labouring class poet, but it is an isolated individual activity as far as the, you know, the, the, the labouring class poets who've kind of gone out on a limb from their culture, the ones who've tried to be, as it were, officially poets. So Duck comes to the attention of the the vicar and his wife, then he comes to the attention of the local aristocrats and court ladies, they take it up to court and tell uh, the Queen about it, he's groomed by Joseph Spence, Professor of Poetry at Oxford, as to how to behave and what kind of books to read and what clothes to wear, and he's presented to Queen Caroline as if a fairy tale had happened. She gives him guineas, and then she's not quite sure what to do with him. Um, we'll make him warden of Duck Island on the River Thames. That's obviously a joke uh, job. Eventually he becomes a clergyman. 
And eventually he kills himself, except that he doesn't. That's the other thing that happens, of course, is that there's no career trajectory for the labouring class poets. Um, what are they supposed to do? Um, you know, they're like sort of boy bands of the age. You know, they've got to have success and then they've got to burn out in some way. Um, I got very angry about this once when I was writing about Bloomfield. Um, Bloomfield is described in the dictionary, old dictionary of national biography as um, lacking manliness and unable to support his family and generally failing as his life comes to an end in, the, in his 50s. Um, I got quite angry because I met these people who make Eolian harps. One of the things he's supposed to have failed at is being an Eolian harp maker, but they told me that no, he was a very successful Eolian harp maker and he for, in fact brought in important design modifications to the Eolian harp. I wrote a very angry editorial in the Bloomfield newsletter called Narratives of Failure, uh, which said, you know, this is the way it is. You're a labouring class poet, you must fail in the end. You must end up mad, alcoholic, insane, or preferably dead early, uh, like Chatterton, who killed himself at 17, except Nick Broom has now challenged that very, very seriously that that happened. And in fact, Dr Jennifer Batt, who's writing a biography of Stephen Duck for Oxford University Press, has, by the simple expedient of going back to the first press reports, established that Stephen Duck didn't kill himself in the end either, as 200 years of history has said he did. He had a stroke and fell in the river. Um, so we've got this whole thing coming through the 18th century of the individual poet who's a kind of freak show, you know, who's to be patronised by the Queen or by some powerful figure. Towards the end of the 18th century, they start falling out very seriously with their patrons. You have the uh, notorious bust-up between Anne Yearsley and Hannah More over money or over control of money. You have James Woodhouse, whose first volume is one long book of versified cringe, really, about his patrons, uh, how, how grateful he is. It's like this dazzling light that shines on him that enables him not to write anything else. And then, 30 years later, he writes a, a long, long autobiographical poem which isn't fit for publication and isn't in fact published until his Victorian grandson publishes it, um, called The Memoirs of um, um, Martin of Scriblerus is the Pope one, but he does a version of that. He does Crispinus Scriblerus, St Crispin being the patron saint of shoemakers, in which he tears into his patrons and patronage in general, and says that being a labouring class poet has been like being a dancing bear. Um, so that whole, um, that whole history is a, is a rather glum one that comes down to uh, the transitional figures, uh, especially Robert Bloomfield and John Clare. It's hard for me to tell you what 18th century networks there are, except for that first opening um, opening example of Stephen Duck, whose poem The Thresher's Labour receives a whole range of replies from other poets. The most important of them is by our local Oldham poet here, Mary Collier, whose The Woman's Labour very precisely echoes and parodies features of The Thresher's Labour. But there's also a, a quite a marvellous one by, um, by the bricklayer uh, poet um, Robert Tattersall, who um, decides he's going to write a poem about his work, and which mostly consists of what an 18th century building site was like. And I was often said to students, that's the only first hand, hand account of an 18th century building site we've got. So, you know, it's valuable for that reason. There's a lot of shouting and noise and a lot of gin drinking all day long, as far as you can tell from his description. Uh, but he also sets up a nice flighting competition with Duck, in his poem to Stephen Duck, the famous threshing poet, uh, he says he's going he's to get his trowel and Stephen Duck must get his threshing flail. Uh, a flail, a trowel, weapons very good if fitly used and rightly understood, but close engaged beware the useless flail, the trowel then can terribly <laughs> prevail. <laughs> if threshers, millers entertain the muse, why not, may not bricklayers to their subjects choose? So we can all have a go, you know. There's a much duller poem by John Frizzle, the miller of Henny Skillin, who uh, 
writes a really boring poem really about what his life's like in, in the mill. Uh, I stand by the mill and I, you know, he says, and uh, if my mouth be open, I get dusty throat. And he goes, well, shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have much sympathy with him, really. But what's interesting is you get this whole group of people responding to Stephen. You get the school of Stephen. And Mary Colley's poem, of course, is the most brilliant and interesting. And um, echoes little things from, from Duck. Duck says, you know, the women come into the fields and they just chat and they don't do any work, they just sit and have lunch and don't know what they're doing, they don't even understand what they're saying, you know. Um, and then they go and hide under the hedge when it rains. And then he says, the next day we have a nice day and the, and the sun shines and the cocks in equal rows appear, you know, the, the hay cocks. And Mary Colley writes a reply in which she says, I, I don't remember really sitting around all day when I was employed in the fields. Yes, we used to have a break, and of course we used to speak. I've never heard of anybody this side of Turkey that wants mutes to serve them. Um, but in any case, we have to get up then, and we have to rake and prow the, the hay. We have to, to, to turn it over, and they rake and prow it in. The case is clear, or else how would cocks in equal rows appear? <laughs> um, and she echoes these phrases from Stephen Duck beautifully and, and does this wonderful kind of parody reply and then goes on to talk about what her winter work was like charring in the houses of rich women she meant getting up in the middle of the night and boiling up and lighting a fire and boiling up a huge big thing you know we can hardly imagine it with our automatic washing machines so you get certain evidence of a community in the sense that those replies exist. You don't really get any continuity. You don't really get any sense of one leading to another or beyond that, that sort of opening kind of set of ripples that Duck's poem creates. What you do get, I think, later on is... Um, a, a tradition of writing back in the sense of, of honouring earlier poets. You can search Claire's notebooks and manuscripts high and low and not find much reference to Stephen Duck or any of the early ones. I think he quotes something from Anne Yearsley somewhere. But it's very frustrating. But he does um, cite Thomas Chatterton, the marvellous boy, the one who supposedly killed himself at 17 but didn't. And Robert Burns. Robert Burns becomes the first figure that lots and lots of labouring class poets write back to in different ways. There's poems about Burns' grave, poems about Burns' writing and so on. As I say, the Scottish tradition is somehow different. There's an evaluation of it and there's a sense of community in it. Fantastic things happened in the 19th century in the town of Paisley. Literally hundreds of volumes were published of poems and songs by labouring class poets, mostly weavers, um, mostly by one publisher. So somehow, if you were a weaver in 19th century Paisley and you knew a few songs and you could knock out a couple of lyrics like Burns, you could get a book of poems published and people would buy it. Uh, they would sell like hotcakes, otherwise why would this guy come on printing them? Um, so Scotland is slightly different. Um, but there isn't a career trajectory and there's no way forward in terms of how to do it. Things come slightly different with Bloomfield. Bloomfield almost blunders into a literary career. Um, you know, he goes to London, he's worked on his uncle's farm, he follows his brothers to London, he works in their shoemaking sweatshop. He's little and young and therefore he's the one who can be spared to go and buy the newspaper and read it out for them all day because they haven't got any Radio 4 in the, those days and they're bored. He sees people making speeches, mostly in Sunday sermons, and he reads Thompson's Caesars, this text that seems to fire people of a, of a, of a humble origins who can read and write to write themselves. And so he writes... The farmer's boy, and he gets picked up by a very unusual patron, Capel Loft, a radical lawyer, uh, a man who had a, a, a passion for publicity as well as radicalism. Uh, some poor local girl was condemned to death for stealing a small amount, and he, not being able to save her, jumped up into the cart with her and rode to the hang to the to the to the gallows with her to, 
to make the point about the injustice and to show that he was on her side. So you get a kind of maverick figure starting to patronise the labouring class poets at that time. But Clare's whole battles in his early life between different identities was very much about how he could find a community and how he could negotiate those patronly and relationships and relationships with publishers that were so difficult. Um, if you look at the correspondence, um, when I was writing my book last year before last on um, John Clare and community, I found a, a fascinating set of connections with Bloomfield and with Keats, uh, both of whom Clare identified with, um, but didn't quite connect with. In fact, physically he didn't. He wanted to visit Bloomfield, but he couldn't because he was too drunk when he was on the coach from London to stop at Bloomfield. That's what he said anyway. He wanted to see Keats. He went to London in 1820. His poems had just been published. One of his poems was set to music. It was being sung at Drury Lane by Madame Vestris. You know, the phrenologists wanted to do his bumps and they wanted to paint his picture and he was suddenly a celebrity and Taylor held a dinner in his honour and who wasn't well enough to go that night? John Keats. Uh, but then in the last year of Keats's life, they're, they're swapping messages via Taylor, the publisher who wasted a lot of money on those two poets one way and another and cared for both of them. And so the connection with Bloomfield is tenuous, the connection with Keats is tenuous. There is one lovely bit of evidence with the Bloomfield, and that is that we have unpublished, well, they're, they're published in my book, um, two letters from Bloomfield to Clare. And it's, it, it's what we're looking for in this sense of the idea of a, a moving, a, a developing community in the labour class poets. Um, I won't read the whole letter, but he talks. He, he's ill by then. Bloomfield gets ill and, and gets weaker in his in his fifties um, and dies. I think probably of diabetes from what he tells, what he says in his letters. Um, he just says he's had Claire's volume and he's he's really thrilled with it. Um, uh, he said he said he starts talking about the poems. So I better not turn critic, but say the truth that nothing upon the great theatre of what is called the world, our English world, can give me half the pleasure I feel at seeing a man start up from the humble walks of life and show himself to be what I think you are, what that is, ask a higher power. For though learning is not to be condemned, it did not give you this. And then he says at the end, um, uh, I find myself tired, he was talking about tiredness in his letters, let nothing prevent you from writing. For though I cannot further your interest, I can feel an interest in it, and I sh assure you I do. And I love that play on interest, you know, interest in that, that era meaning, you know, ha having interest means having the power to help somebody along financially or otherwise. He's turning it and saying the other kind of interest, which is I care about what's happening to you. Um, and ends by saying, I've written this on my old oak table and I think you know what that means. His Bloomfield's poem to his old oak table is about finding a kind of consolation and a comfort in life in this solid piece of furniture which has literally supported all his writing. And so he's trying to pass that forward to Claire. So there is this kind of evidence of a, of a developing tradition. And when we did these six volumes of... Uh, labouring class poetry for um, Pickering and Chateau a few years ago, we did some very kind of intricate um, subject indexing and one of the things we did was intertexts. Looking at it now I think we were probably a bit ornate with our, um, our categories. We, we, you know, we, we decided to make a huge thing of the thematic index we had. Patrons and patronage, poverty and charity, self-presentation and creativity, labour and the workplace. But we had intertexts and we distinguished between intertexts with canonical writers, intertexts with traditional materials and intertexts with other labouring class poets. And I think as the 19th century develops, you can see that last category developing much more strongly. Um, is there then a community? Well, yes, there is. 
and the community develops in such mid 19th century movements as especially Chartism, which has its own newspapers, its own novelists, its own poets, its own subculture, really. Um, but also in lots of other ways. Um, I think if you look to particular areas, for example, you can find different senses of communities growing from the labouring class tradition. Um, I think in terms of, of, of different cities in specifically, I think I've, I've talked about um, um, I talked about Paisley, for example, where clearly there is a very, very strong tradition of support for these writers and therefore a community. But um, I'm, I know I'm moving kind of beyond the Romantic period, but I think you can kind of see the way that this thing has developed through the 19th century. And I'm going to use some later 19th century examples um, simply because I, I, I happen to edit the late 19th century volume, so I'm more familiar with the examples in this tradition. Um, in Manchester, let's do three around Manchester uh, to set against three around Farnham. Um, you've got figures kind of beginning to develop a path of, of publication and a path of finding roles for themselves within the community. Um, Samuel Laycock, for example, who became known as the Cotton Famine poet, though um, technically a Yorkshire man, decamped over the bumps to the Manchester side very early in his life, and became a kind of, um, well, worked in popular dialect forms, and I think dialect is, is, is very strong in the 19th century. We've, we, we associate early dialect writing, and in fact later dialect writing, with humour, you know, with figures uh, from Lancashire, you know, running right through to people like George Formby, but um, right back to the 18th century. But um, he uses it quite often in a, in a more serious way to, to give himself a role with and to get involved in the community. And his moment comes with the cotton famine of 1860, which is caused by the blockading of the southern ports. Um, cotton is all that Lancashire does by then, especially Manchester, Cottonopolis. And so Laycock starts writing these uh, broadsheet poems. They're just printed very cheaply on pieces of paper and sold for a penny or whatever in the streets. And they sell like hot cakes, they sell in their thousands. He becomes a genuine popular poet. I'll give you a little taste of what he's doing. There's no good in cowering in the dust, is the title of this. Come, Dick, let's have hold of the hand. What a dreadful long face that keeps pulling. These bad times they'll ne'er manage to stand, except their minds well what they're doing. If I've out in me house or me purse, at that, at that, and really in need on, I'll lend it. I see the old coat's getting worse, uh, but I'll look up a patch to mend it. I wish I'd me a hat full of gold. I'd make somebody glad with me giving. I'd miss neither young folk nor old that wanted a lift with their living. There's thousands of poor folk I know, or hard times and poverty grieving. There's one or two who lives it next row. I should feel rare and proud. For relieving. Well, this is what Brian Maidman would call the homely tradition. Uh, but you know, the idea is the poet is just one of the community. You know, he's talking to an individual. He's just the person next door. But actually, he, he's also able to import what Maidman. Maidman makes three categories: homely, political, and Parnassian. And he actually manages to smuggle a bit of. Uh, political and Parnassian in. Quite interesting, I think, in the early poem like Starved to Death. Starved to Death, did you say? Dear me, why bless us, where in the world could that be? Were it somewhere in Greenland where the north winds blow, or rambling up moors and lost in the snow, etc.? Nay, nay, you're not starved on a foreign strand, but here, at home, in this Christian land, where the sound of the organ going bell is heard and charities preached in the name of our Lord. Where the priest and the Levite on luxuries dine and nobles and statesmen get fuddled on wine. It were here, in old England, this queen of the isles, this garden of ours, on which providence 
smiles I've come out of dialect for a purpose then because he has really what he's doing there is citing the King James Version and Richard II very clearly this garden, this Eden, etc, etc this other Eden so that dialect verse isn't quite just as, uh, as local and as limited as it seems but it's certainly found its target audience if you look at another, Lanc- uh, another Manchester poet, again someone who came in from outside, Fanny Forrester, whose mother and brother were both Fenian activists and were imprisoned at various times for it. Her take was to write very sentimental, doggerelish poems about the condition of being in exile from Ireland. Because, of course, Liverpool and Manchester in the mid-19th century were full of, flooded with... Irish people trying to, trying to manage and, and uh, work in the cotton industry. The mother and the daughter wander the streets, wanly. Uh, and we get the, the, the poem, um, uh, the three-part poem called Strangers in the City. The first one's homeless in the city. The second one's toiling in the city. And the third one, I'm sure you're ahead of me, is dying in the city because this is the Victorian age and some of these poets are not ashamed of putting sentimental feeling in. She's weary, oh so weary of the engine's deafening sound. This is the girl. Though her head is dazed and aching, still the mighty wheels go round. Will they never cease their grinding off the wandering maiden? Cries as the straps go whirling round her, then go whizzing past her eyes. This stuff was also massively popular, and where did she publish it? She published it in Ben Briley's journal, which uh, sold thousands every week. Ben Briley was himself a labouring class poet, and she was his star poet in his poetry section. So one week he has a little picture of her engraved in a biography. And Ben Briley gains another kind of community role, which is there used to be quite a lot of Ben Briley pubs in Manchester because of this he became eventually a local councillor and he gave his maiden speech to Manchester City Council in May 1876 on a question of locating the free reference library in the upper rooms of the new town hall. And he gives a speech about facetiously mocking those who said they don't need a library, they can just use the attic in the town hall. And he starts talking about all the steps and how it wouldn't be practical and old people would get worn out and people would get lost. And then he recites a poem of his own construction to the assembled Manchester City Council, which is a parody of Longfellow's poem Excelsior. The shades of night were falling fast as up the town hall step there passed the man on whom the man who on his shoulders bore full seventy winters, and he swore these cursed stairs. And on and on it goes to about 12 verses. The reading of these verses caused much merriment and Mr Briley sat down amid shouts of laughter and cheers. And the next time you go into Manchester Central Library with its wonderful dome modelled on the British Museum dome, remember that poem because that's what won the argument and won the vote and that's why that library in Manchester was built. So these poets so powerless and so isolated in the 18th century, by then were sometimes finding very clear roles for themselves. Um, this whiz up to the northeast, where there's a very dr- different tradition. In the northeast, there's a very strong performative tradition, not like Manchester really. I mean, Manchester is kind of social and engaged and political, but in the northeast. Um, there's a tradition of um, singing in pubs and reciting in pubs, so-called free and easies and temperance um, rooms and other outlets, theatres. Here we are getting from the isolated, you know, madman writing poems with charcoal back to David's uh, world of the theatres, except it's on a smaller scale. And that performativity can be seen in poet after poet, like the labouring class poet uh, Joe Wilson, who uses humour, really. I don't know whether you'd say there was much politics in it, but um, he has things like monologues, 
I wish your mother would come, or would Jodie's notions of, I can't do the accent at all, I should get you to come and read this. Uh, or what Jodie's notions about men nursing bairns. And Jodie's left, his wife goes shopping and leaves the bairn with him. Being a Jodie male, he doesn't even know which way up to hold it, and in fact drops it in about, I think, the second verse. Then Jodie held the bairn, but said against his will, the poor bit thing was good, but Jodie had no skill. He hadn't its mother's ways. He, had both, he sat both stiff and numb. Before five minutes was passed, he wished its mother would come. That's the refrain. I wish your mother would come. I wish your mother. It wants its tit, he says. It's hungry, and I don't know what to do. And he drops it, you know, and picks it up again. Is it, and, and what he does is he finds real pleasure in that richness of dialect. He does it again in a, a poem called um, The Row Upon the Stairs. The, the row poem is a staple in the northeast. Tommy Armstrong has the row between the cages where these two uh, pit cages have an argument as to which one's the best. <laughs> uh, and these, this is two women in the, in the tenement and one of them says to the other, it's your turn to clean the stairs and then this argument develops. And he's loving using that dialect to, to effect and they get really, they start, you know, hacking verbal lumps out of each other. Says Mistress Todd, you great skit gob, you'd better have your jaw. The very shift upon your back belongs the wife below. You lazy wretch, shouts Mistress Bell, it's true, there is no doot. Last night you fuddled with Bob the Snob the time your man was out. <laughs> <laughs> skit gob, that means fish mouth. Uh, the shift on your back belongs the wife below. Even the dress you're wearing, you've stolen off the washing line from the woman downstairs. Uh, you fuddled with Bob the snob. It means you uh, canoodled with Bob the shoemaker when your husband was there. And he's really just kind of, it's the pleasure, isn't it? It's the pure pleasure of the dialect that is being used. I mean, there is a series. The interesting thing is when he comes to write a poem about the Hartley catastrophe was one of the many coal mining catastrophes of, of the 19th century. Uh, 204 men and boys were buried alive in the new Hartley pit. This is Harry Robbins. By the watchfires glow amid the falling snow, there reigns a death like gloom, while prayers are murmured for those below, immured in a living tomb. So it just goes straight, boom, Geordie accent gone, dialect gone, straight into respectful RP, like putting a suit on at a funeral. Um, and I think you can find all kinds of uh, these kind of complexities. There's a flexibility about that. Um, there's the idea that you can, um, you can put accents and voices and personalities on and off. Um, I'm just going to stay in the North East uh, to conclude. I mean, even if you just go looking at the different books, when I... Um, when I bought up these books for the, for the collection, and we've now added all Brian Maidman's books to it, we've got quite a really good collection, I found all sorts of interesting things in the physical evidence of the books. Very similarly you know, to the kind of things that you were seeing this morning in the, in the manuscripts from the archive. Um, the books tell you something really interesting. Robert Elliot's Poems and Recitations, Choppington, 1877, is a plain ultra slim pamphlet, this is the catalogue that, that me and the librarians did, a plain ultra slim pamphlet of verses produced by Newcastle coal miner offering a good example of the most modest level of labouring class publication with dialect and political verse. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny little book. Who's paid for its publication? Well, whoever it was wasn't rich. Uh, it's the most modest uh, kind of publication you can have. Contrast with that Henry Holdings' Rhymes and Dreams, Legends of Pendle Forest and Other Poems, Burnley, published by B. Moore for the Joint Committee of the Literary and Scientific Club and the Literary and Philosophical Society, whose uh, archivist has, has gone now, but um, uh, uh, you can see there that there were resources coming out of the development of local clubs and societies. Why have they published his poems? because it includes a title that says Legends of Pendle Forest, and therefore that whole developing local and regional pride, that new sense of our community being different from anybody else's, is, uh, is powerful. Um, you could talk about other, 
other ways in which communities um, are ex you know expressed and manifest in these traditions. I'm going to finish in the northeast since I've gone there now. I'm going to talk a little bit about a poet called Joseph Skipsey, who was much valued in his time, but who seems to be the most isolated figure, who learns to write uh, at the bottom of a pit um, as a trapper boy, in other words, somebody who's paid to stand in the darkness for 12 hours a day, opening and shutting ventilation doors, uh, with a stub of candle and a few old playbills, and then he graduates to Paradise, not Thompson Seasons, but Paradise Lost. Somebody says, here is an old copy of Paradise Lost, read that. Uh, and then on to Shakespeare. And becomes one of the most astonishingly ambitious of, of all the labouring class poets of that period. Works for a while at the Lytton Phil and then for a while at Shakespeare's birthplace. Uh, an incident in his life on which Henry James's story, The Birthplace, is based. Um, but actually what he's remembered for is a few little short lyric poems about work and life in that era, in that time. Here's one, there's only eight lines, I'll read it all. Get up, the caller calls, get up, and in the dead of night, to win their bairns, their bite and sup, I rise, a weary white. My flannel dudden donned, thrice o'er my birds are kissed, and then I with a whistle shut the door, I may not ope again. Uh, and it doesn't waste a word there, it's about preparing for work. Labour intrudes right into family life with the caller and comes round knocking on windows early in the, in, the, in the morning, murdering sleep in the unnatural dead of night and the, leaving the, the worker, he says, a weary white. Um, and that interesting thing about putting his duds on, his dudden, his working clothes, putting up that new, you know, becoming a different person, uh, and then he, he has to win the bairns their bite and sup. That's the key thing, is getting the kids food and drink to eat. They're the ones he kisses, the birds that he kisses. Why does he kiss them three times? Why does he say, the door that I may not open again? Because of the Hartley Pit disaster. Because he might not get home again. That's the point. It's like a superstition. It's like a footballer kissing some little rabbit's foot or something before he goes onto the pitch. It's a superstitious thing. It's not like kisses three, like he kisses four, you know, in, in La Belle Dame. It's, a, it's to say it might be the last time he kisses them. So you can put, even in a tiny little lyric, that some intensity of, of that community's uh, self-identity. But to me, actually, the most interesting example, I haven't bought the book today, I'm sorry that I haven't, is... Um, is a poem that's almost completely forgotten because it's in dialect, it's not online. I had to get the British Library to print off a, one of their, you know, print on demand things. And it's um, a collection right from the end of the century by Alexander Barris called The Pitman's Social Neat. And um, Barris published this. He had a complete breakdown and went into a mental hospital. So his friends and his local MP published it. <coughs> and it's about the protagonist goes into the pub on a, on a Friday night which is pay night and there's a couple having a row about money and whether they can afford to, she wants money for furniture and he hasn't got enough for it, he wants to spend it somewhere else and they're rowing and the landlord gets his friend Marshall to sing a song and uh, to calm things down and from that simple beginning suddenly you've got an evening in which everybody has to do a turn Right, everyone has to tell a story or sing a song. You've got a portmanteau, you've got a Canterbury Tales or a Decameron, or it's not on that scale. And as you go through it, you realise that each term that each individual does represents one stage in the career of a pitman. In other words, the first one is about being a trapper boy, and then it goes right through to being a deputy and an overman. And in the middle of that, you have all sorts of stuff about the anxieties. Uh, about what it costs to be a coal miner. And um, also a lovely, uh, and it's in a tradition that goes right back to Edward Chicken uh, in the 1730s, um, writing a, about uh, his poem, The Collier's Wedding, Thomas Wilson's The Pitman's Pay of 1840. It's in a tradition of coal miners writing about their community. 
The Pitman social need, and I will finish with this, is um, he's got suddenly um, little moments in which you suddenly realise that this community is, is not quite as, um, as fixed in that idea of being, you know, this is our labour, this is our work, this is what we do. They're, they're questioning it. And one of the things that shines through is, um, is a kind of steely learnedness that, you know, is associated with a very powerful self-taught tradition in the coal fields. Um, Eliot's little pamphlet book, Robert Eliot's, comes out of the tradition of coal miners having poetry writing competitions. You know about the, the uh, Pitman painters, I'm sure you've heard of because of the play that was written recently. But that tradition of self-education is powerful. So there's one of these uh, poems. Um, it's actually the, the guy who's been rowing, and it's the conciliation between the couple. And he says at the end, he goes through all the bad things that happened in their life, how their child died, and he got sick and couldn't work. And then he says, That look tramps with us step for step for a dribbling life's brand new beginnings, like his own shadow haunts a chap till he's played through life's dowly innings. Greet men poo-poos, no mars, no mens, these facts of life. On looking through them, we find a fate that shapes, shapes war ends, no matter how we may rough hew them. Which is Hamlet, isn't it? Only it's octosyllables <coughs> instead of decasyllables. And then a little bit later on, uh, there's another thing about how how the, 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 the mighty and the posh and the rich, the men that struts, the, 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 the men in stays that struck the tune. That's the, the um, I'm trying to imagine these uh, rich men, you know, who wear his stays and struck round Newcastle for the 18th century, the 19th century. The many stays that struck the tune detest the name of Pitt, though not worth a half a crown, their cells deem George a chit, deem Geordie a cheat. He's very low, there's very high, but if I've reported prophecy, on some fine day, now very light, nigh, he'll prove their equals yet. If works ignoble, Ruskin lays, Tam Carlyle does the same. If our idleness is easy ease, act him that stops at him. The duffers, they do just as soon lob free the land above the moon as do the work that Geordie's doing. Shame on them, fie for shame. They would as soon jump over the moon is do the work that we do. But what I'm interested in is the beginning of that stanza. If works ignoble, Ruskin leaves, Tam Carlyle does the same. Roll back a bit. We're sitting in the pub on Friday night talking in dialect about our lives and singing and drinking and suddenly, no, we're not. We're citing the two most respected prose writers of the 19th century, Ruskin and Carlyle, who we've read. Um, and you can suddenly see a glimpse into a tradition that wishes to open itself up, that wishes to raise itself. It's the same tradition that had Stephen Duck reading by candlelight to the annoyance of his family 150 years earlier. But here is in a community setting. I'll leave it there. Thank you. writing about an occasion rather yeah. than contributing directly to remembering something. Mm. And you can trace that right back to, to John Clare who's something like the crossroads. 
where he's recounting storytelling in its setting. And his setting is a field. Uh, these women who were field workers, Mary Collier's brother and Stephen Ducks, um, stop because it's raining. And they form into two groups. And the younger group talk about love tokens and loved ones and all this. And the older ones look very sourly at that. And one of them says, come over here, we'll tell you a story. We'll teach you, we'll be, we'll be alarmed about young men bearing gifts. And it's a tragic story about how a friend was killed. And he's buried at the crossroads because she killed herself. Because her boy made her pregnant. And it's clear from that framing narrative that Claire is recounting from the outside. Something that probably he will have heard and seen and witnessed being told as a child when he was sent out into do field work with the old women. Um, Barras is, is, is saying from the outside, McGonagall, <laughs> well, McGonagall's the most, um, McGonagall is the biggest name in my volume. I took on this last volume because they wanted one, and they said, oh, yeah, Kay will do me, then no, you'll do this. And he said, oh, but there's nobody for the late 19th century, so I went, I'll do it. <laughs> And then I realised that McGonagall is my biggest name in this volume. He, and he's, what's more, he's the best-selling poet of all six volumes. And I went, oh my God, what am I going to do with McGonagall? And I suddenly realised from reading essays and uh, material um, uh, that, that there's actually a, a, there's a recovery of McGonagall that's most interesting, that sees McGonagall as coming out of a purposely humorous, loquacious Irish-Scottish oral tradition um, that would suggest McGonagall is wise to this game that's going on around him all the time, including the mugging, including the solitary walk up to Balmoral where the sergeant turns him away so he can't present himself to the Queen as a Scottish poet laureate in waiting, and all the other stuff about making him the Knight of Burma and the White Elephant and stuff... He's playing that as a game, and the origins of the, the generic origins of his writing come from that. As for the performativity, it's more complex because the, um, the young students from Edinburgh University started attending his performances and cheering with wild irony everything that he said and writing him his letters, you know, reverend letters saying, Now is the Shakespearean or the McGonagallian the right tradition for tragedy? And, and so there's a whole lot of levels of parody and humour going on all around this man who isn't at all the simple linen weaver that he says he is. He comes out of all kinds of cultural stuff. So it's a very muddling answer, I'm afraid, but um, clearly there were all kinds of literal performativity of the type that David has described in the theatre going on in the pubs and the meeting rooms and so on, and that's north of the border as well. Um, in Edinburgh, theatres came very late, um, I mean formal theatres came very late, um, and so I'm not, I can't really tell you that much about performance spaces there, but um, Edinburgh and Dundee, which is of course McGonagall's base, hasn't really answered the question, but it's sort of wandered around it a bit. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah? Uh, that was a really fascinating talk, thank you. Uh, you touched on um, the flourishing of the labour and class budget tradition or community around chartism. Yeah. Uh, was there a similar upsurge in a kind of community of radical labour and class poets in the 1790s or around the uh, Reform Act in the early 1830s? Did that happen or was that, that sort of chartist upsurge of... Yeah, no, you can point to stray individuals. You can point to individuals like Ebenezer Elliott, the Corn Law poet, who, you know, like the cotton farming poet, found a single issue that would make his, his, his name. But I, I, my sense is that the politics is certainly there. You'd need to look at Tim Burke's the Volume 3 of the Pickling and Chateau series, which is the end of the 18th century. There's much more political discussion just generally going on. Yeah. I don't know whether you can point to a particular movement. All you can say is that these poets are much, much, much more political than Stephen Duck or Mary Collier or anybody like that ever was. Um, 1830s, I'm not quite as, sh as, as sure. I mean, the politics is not as, as um, available. It depends. It depends what you make of something like Claire's, you know, the Moors and the anti-enclosure poems. Are they political or are they just as observed? material on his own culture. 
Um, I've sort of, I've, I've, I've kind of danced around, because Chartism is such a huge subject. As I say, it has its own complete sort of subculture, and yeah. novelists and so on, and Ian Hayward's written about. And, but um, yes, I mean, <laughs> as I said, there are 1,720 poets here. You know, do you see that thing in The Guardian last week where they showed all the aeroplanes in the air over the whole world? And you could clip the web page, and it went like that. And there were well, it's looking at the links between these is a bit like that. Um, there are all kinds of, of traces you can make. I'm not avoiding the issue, but the answer is you would find plenty of evidence. I don't think you can find something you can describe as a specific movement. Uh, if you do, it will be likelier in the 1790s. Uh, there's a sudden surge, um, but it's not. It doesn't have a link like all those post-Duck Labour poems have a link, or like the North East dialect performative poems have a link, uh, or the Mancunian social consciousness ones do. Uh, or if it, if, the, if it has, I haven't found it yet. Yeah, John? Yeah, um, I was just thinking about the, the different kinds of community to which you referred. I mean, in making that, when you made that switch from uh, Manchester to Newcastle, yeah. yeah. Um, so, just to just just try and think about, I'm trying to think about what you said. You've, you've got labouring class poets, um, just so so you might have someone who writes about a certain kind of agricultural labour, like Mary Collier, you know, down the road, mm. and that might be a way of writing about that community of this part of the world, and everyone who's engaged in some way in that visible labour of agriculture can share in that as a community. But that's very different, is it, I'm asking the question, uh, to Paisley, where you've got a certain almost industrial capacity to share in labour, but that's not the whole community that might be sharing in that labour in the same way as an agricultural town or village. It is most of it actually. But, in but then, but then yeah. perhaps it might become self-consciously, the town might self-consciously uh, become associated with that poetry. It's so that's a kind of secondary yeah. level of, yeah, yeah, of yeah. community identifying with the cultural product that comes out of it. And then you've got this, what you seem to be saying is much more multifarious. Uh, pub, club, assembly room, temperance hall, uh, set up in in, um, in Newcastle. So I'm just trying to think about there are different kinds of community depending on what kind of labour is involved and what kind of um, what kind of nodal point of of you know community there is surrounding it as well. Right? Okay. Yeah. No. It's a good question. Um, what connects Paisley uh, poets isn't poetry. It's weaving. Mm-hmm. And it is a, it's a it's a textile town. It's a weaving town. Yeah. And um, I think the poetry comes out of that, and you could probably pin that down to one person, one publisher who says, who sees that there's a demand for this stuff, or there's a demand for putting into print what's already being spoken and sung. Um, uh, so I don't think it becomes name. It, oh, it's only later that people say nobody's produced more published poets in the whole empire. I think someone says than Paisley. Um, in the northeast, I've mixed up two things really. One is the coal mining. Culture and it's and it's it's what I call it's sort of steely self-educated tradition and it's tradition of um, poetry writing and the pub and club culture, which is very much about performativity and humorous uh, figures, Billy Purvis, Ned Corvan, all these kind of semi-legendary performative figures of the 19th century. They come together in Barris, who is both. He's a he's a coal miner. And he's, but he's also writing about coal miners at, um, at the point at which they join that performative culture. But there are two certain, certainly at least two different things going on there. Um, and I didn't make that clear, I don't think. I mean, I, I'm trying to draw some uh, categories and some... But, you know, I do feel that uh, we are still at the beginning of this project, really. Um, and there's so much to be done. My... Um, American graduate student angels are doing things like going through all the sources on manuscripts and archives and adding those into the entries, you know, trying to work out what new categories to put for databases. So I think that, you know, they'll have to find some kind of shorthand for those categories you're talking about, um, 
you know, this is a Manchester one, it's a performativity one, it's a whatever it is. So in other words, we're still kind of building up the informational database on this whole yeah. field. And in, uh, plus which, what, what is a labouring class poet? It's a very, very, it's a deliberately baggy concept. And that itself is a backlash against the very specific um, appropriations of this tradition made earlier, and particularly made earlier in Eastern Europe and Soviet Russia, where a labouring poet had to be something very specific. It had to be industrial, it had to be political, it didn't have to be religious, which two-thirds of them are, etc. We're trying to say, okay, let's let everybody into this tent and then let's count them, you know, and then see what they are. Yeah. Even the penge potato poet, rubbish as he is. Um, and then see what, what the tradition is. So in other words, we haven't... Your questions are really good ones, but, you know, we haven't really pinned that down enough yet. I don't so that's, that's where I'm coming from, is encountering within a subculture, I mean, you meant, I mean, which I think would be probably different from a kind of labour. Yeah. Uh, so you might have weavers, or you might have coal miners. Yeah. Well, I suppose the ones I'm familiar with again is boxing, right? And manly sports. So yeah. So in London, what you seem to have is a network of often through publicans who come down from other parts of um, the UK. So from Liverpool, Wigan, Manchester, to name but three of the ones I'm familiar with, and they're known as purveyors of poems, not just songs. Right. In, in those pubs in London where the fancy is celebrating itself. Mm. So it seems to me that that's a kind of subcultural national network that's also producing a, uh, a labouring class, perhaps, might, you know, might be this, a, a useful term for them as well, but actually they're inhabiting a different space within mm. the culture and have different kinds of networks because it's a subcultural one rather than one that's based on a kind of labour or you know, uh, the work that they do. Yeah, I, I, in a way I think that's what you're getting with what Barris is describing. Yeah, yeah. Because what are they doing? Is they're writing, they're writing them, you know, the, the, well they're singing and talking and drinking in moderation, he says. Um, but they're writing their lives and the anxieties in their lives. And in fact, because it starts with that row, which is between a couple and is over money, that sets the tone for the whole thing. Who are we? How do we say who we are? How do we validate our lives by this activity of singing and speaking in verse? That's a subculture creating itself, if you like. Uh, subculture is quite the right word there. But it's just, it's just, it's, you see what I mean? It has that idea of a group identifying itself in some way, uh, not yeah. randomly put together by some 21st century, sure, you know, yeah. loud mouth in a university, um, but actually identifying yeah. itself and creating itself yeah. at a time. Yeah. Okay. So, well. um, yesterday we were talking about Lytton Fields and how Manchester and Newcastle had communications with each other, yeah. and that kind of based in Warrington and things like that, and it struck me that <clears throat> we were looking at fairly separate creative communities in different places here. And the dialect, dialect might be a barrier to that, obviously, the yeah. different dialect. And uh, you talked about Skipsy, he's always really interested me because he managed to to be a dialect poet who you know, met Tennyson, and, you know, all, all these things and became quite, not quite a national celebrity, yeah. but someone that people knew nationally. Yeah, he actually um, knew Ruskin and Carlyle. Yeah, and, and so, <laughs> but, 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 but was still famed for being a, a dialect poet. Now, I grew up in Newcastle in the, in the 80s, and my grandparents always talk about Bobby Thompson, who was a yeah. famous Newcastle comedian. We're really yeah. from Sunderland, but that's not really important. And the, the t TV was the TV was the death. Locally. Of him. TV was the death of him. Right. The, right. Like when Thompson got an ITV contract, so he was massively famous in the northeast, and he went down and did one series of a TV show, and they were just like, we don't find him very funny at all nationally because he's not he's not capable of doing that. Now, is that do you see that Newcastle trends or Manchester trends cross? The Pennines or come into other parts, or is dialect kind of inhibitor? I haven't found that in the time really, except that what you could say is a lot of these uh, volumes would be published nationally, and you can see when there's a London publisher on it as well. Um, whereas Barras is not a London publisher, it's, um, it's a Gateshead publisher, I think. Um, but some of them do, and when they do, they're published in London or Edinburgh as well, from Newcastle sometimes. But um, that, you know, that dialect tradition is, uh, 
is is still strong. And I mean, I think it's um, I don't know where is it now. Viz Comics, Viz Comics, still broad Geordie, as broad as da- as Barris, and uh, nationally sold. It's got to be funny though, hasn't it? It's the only way you can sell it. You can't sell it as a serious accent. How does it work? You know, how does that, how does that national or, or you know taking that dialect elsewhere without it being destroyed as TV destroyed Bobby Thompson in the northeast locally? There's still a great valuation of some of these traditions, and um, Tommy Armstrong's song "Trimmed and Grange Explosion" is still sung in folk clubs. Um, uh, I've sung it myself, and because uh, it's a cappella, it's easy to do. And you know, there's still a great local valuation of a lot of these figures. Not Barris. Barris has fallen through every kind of hole in history. Um, but you know, it's quite difficult to see in the time how this stuff's spreading other than London publishers, which some of them have. I think um, Laycock has a London publisher. Fanny Forrester exists in the pages of Ben Briley's journal and nowhere else. A couple of other journals, possibly. You know, but, yeah. Just on that last one, I'm just wonder how you see Simon Armitage's handling of Laycock. You know, because they're both from, from Marsden, aren't they? And yeah. So, you know, he's had a go, hasn't he? It's Armitage not using dialect in the main. And yeah. Then suddenly taking up Laycock and choosing to engage with dialect. Well, there's always this, isn't there? You know, mm. Stephen Duck was getting told off up to 20 years ago for going a bit mainstream after Queen Caroline adopted him and not writing about his labour anymore, you know. Um, there's always that thing, isn't there? You know that somehow, if Joe Wilson can suddenly drop his entire northeast persona for a memorial poem, then is that just a game? You know, was the whole thing just a game? I mean, you know, we all have multiple identities. I'm not that. That I, I mean, I love what what Simon Armitage has done with Laycock, and I think that's you know the same kind of valuation that sees Tommy Armstrong being sung in folk clubs in the northeast. But um, that initial thing about not using dialect sometimes is a bit of a red herring, I think. Writers can put on all sorts of clothes, can't they? See, this is my outlook with these poets. I want them to be able to do whatever they like, you know. <laughs> um, so I'm not, I'm not right. I'm not going to get involved very closely in arguments. Say, oh, you know, the mainstream, you know, RP is just a kind of sellout or something like that, which I think is an argument you sometimes hear and have done right back to the 1730s. Thanks very much, Sean. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs>